Once one has become a psychic citizen of Atlantis by passing the Contributors Club ritual, they may choose to pursue additional rank in Atlantis, which makes them eligible for holding office in its government or church banks. There are three such extra rank rituals, and they are collectively called Egyptian Masonry, due to the plot of the drama they describe. The third initiation ritual, the second of the set called Egyptian Masonry, is hosted in the Air Lodge, with bricks of pink and mortar yellow capped by a yellow dodecahedron. This ritual is called Tahotep's Double Cross, and its moral is to teach the student the good of working in groups to accomplish goals. In this ritual, the candidate is guided into the darkened vault and the door closed behind them. The candidate steps down into water and is greeted in the gloom by the living Nyarlathotep, who welcomes the candidate to the caves below the Giza Plateau. On a small island in the middle of the dark cave are twin pillars made of internally illuminated crystal. Nyarlathotep explains he intends to kill the candidate seal the gateway, leave Imhotep in hell, and for himself to live forever. Imhotep's voice comes from between the twin crystal pillars, and the actor portraying the living Nyarlathotep becomes Imhotep alive again. As the true form of Nyarlathotep attacks through the portal, Imhotep commands the candidate, playing the part of Tuahotep, to summon the dead workers to help fend off Nyarlathotep. There, the third ceremony ends. Tahotep's Double Cross Introduction As in the first and second A degree rituals, we begin in an antechamber outside the vault. An initiator or guide of no lower than this 2 B degree in attainment, themselves explains the knowledge lecture and the history, characters, and plot of the rite. Once the candidate confirms to the guide they understand this instruction, they enter the vault. Guide While Imhotep passed through the underworld, along the Milky Way, Tahotep, his son, was left as his appointed head of the overseer's order. While the couriers labored by day, the overseers conserved their energy. But then, by night, the overseers instructed the couriers in the higher arts of democracy, masonry, tarot, and the calendar, and all sorts of splendid wonders. They began to raise the pyramids by constructing an enormous enclosure around the entire base layer and filling it with water to float the blocks into place with a giant boat. All looked forward to Imhotep's return, but Tahotep did not overwork the workers. Tahotep was the wisest of all the overseers and beloved by the clay people. He instructed them in all of his father Imhotep's metaphysics, and they all became as learned as he in time. Nyarlathotep served as Tahotep's own vizier, and if Tahotep but lifted a finger on his right hand, Nyarlathotep would wave the thousands of workers to all move as one to the right. And if Tahotep lifted a finger on his left hand, Nyarlathotep would command the thousands of workers to all move in one wave to the left. Yet Tahotep was not full of pride, and served not as king, but only as court magician to the three great kings of our craft, Cheops, Kefir, and Menkare. The legions of undead all answered to the heart of Nyarlathotep, who offered it then to Tahotep, though only until the return of Imhotep, the coming time of which no one knew.
but Naralahotep. This ritual is about the times when Naralahotep showed Tahotep the catacombs beneath Giza. When Naralahotep told Tahotep that Imhotep was never coming back and that he, Naralahotep, was Tahotep's true father. The ritual continues when Imhotep returns as a chaos beast, judges Nyarlathotep a traitor, and switches bodies with him, thus sending Nyarlathotep in the form of the chaos beast back into the netherworld. The meaning of this ritual is to teach the Atlantean Mason the mechanism of transcending the mundane cares of material reality. Instruction If the candidate gives the word to affirm they understand, the guide ushers the candidate into the darkened vault and closes the door after them. In the middle of the darkened vault, the candidate sees an arcing domed grotto, roofed with crystals, above an underground lake. On a sandbar near the closest shore, beneath the peak of the catacomb's dome, arise two very tall, men here stone blocks, ancient with weather. The one on the left of a dark, metallic hue, the one on the right of a brighter, marble hue. The candidate will come to see there is strange, indecipherable and ever-shifting information being projected as patterns within the crystalline veins of the two massive upright towers. These flash like slow lightning within the twin stones and this light alone illuminates the cavern. From the shadows behind the candidate's back, hiding behind the door of the vault as the candidate had entered, Nyarlathotep speaks. As he speaks, he places his grip on the candidate's right shoulder and then steps up beside them into the light. He is dressed as a vagabond mummy still, with blood staining the hieroglyphic inscriptions carefully painted onto his gauze wrappings. Nyarlathotep these are the pillars buried by Enoch in the city east of Eden in Atlantis before the flood. Imhotep had them transported here. He discovered them by the stone of Ram, the keystone of Noah that he found and deciphered just outside of Ur in southern Babylon. As he journeyed northwest to pass by Sinai into Egypt. Ram, the tablet of testimony, was the key to all languages once. Its geometric shape is timeless, and the markings upon it, the inscriptions of seven of the ten archangels, the pre-diluvial Atlantean king's list, I tell you, the splendor of Ram shall be known to all on Judgment Day, and is yet taught to all who seek to know it. It is a testament to the seven sinister angels who rebelled and who were cast down into this material universe. I, Nyarlathotep, am wise of the dawn of time, as was Imhotep before he died. Those who follow the Ram Stone now seeking to find these twins stilly, will get lost and fall into confusion. For now Enoch's tomb is empty, and these twins stilly are here, buried beneath the three kings' tombs. Instruction Nyarlathotep guides the candidate by their shoulder and begins leading them down a slight slope towards the crystal irradiated stone main hairs. One dark, one light. They step to the water's edge. The closer Nyarlathotep draws towards the twin megaliths, 
the more he stoops down and assumes a more lizard-like posture and visage. He urges the candidate toward the two obelisks, and they begin wading out ankle-deep in the shallow waters of the lake's shore. Nyarlahotep I suppose you'd like me to tell you what they say. They are written in Atlantean and contain all the secrets of the universe. It is these each of my corpses seeks to replicate by quarrying the Ashlars to build the tomb for the three great kings who we call the Three Fools. For this project is damned folly without these stones being here. Without them, the resurrected dead would not obey me. Just as they are bound to my heart, my heart is bound to these two steely. The kings know nothing of these catacombs, nor of this lake, nor of these stelae. This secret is known to myself and Imhotep, and now you also, but to us alone. We three are Thoth, Osiris, and Horus. Do you not see Tahotep? Just as Imhotep gave his soul for mine, did he become like Thoth, God over time, for he dwells now beyond all time. And just as Imhotep assumed the god form of Thoth, so too did I assume the god form of Osiris. Now, let me tell you how the heavens have already recorded and dictated our destinies. Imhotep is Thoth. I am Osiris. And you are Horus, Tahotep. To raise Osiris, Thoth gave his own life, you see. And so, Imhotep shall never return from the underworld. He sacrificed himself and has given you, his son, over to me. Now, I am the Great Works Architect, for, I assure you, Imhotep is no more. Instruction. The two stones loom over them on a sandbar. Nyarlahotep climbs up the slight embankment. His face appears to be that of a supernaturally large serpent. He stands beside the bright one and reaches out to touch it. As his fingers contact the stone's cold surface, a jolt of lightning bursts through them both, causing a Jacob's Ladder to arise between them. From within this, the Chaos Beast of Nyarlahotep's true form appears. Voice over. Booming. It is I, Nyarlahotep. It is I, Tahotep. It is I, Imhotep, returned from beyond the grave, in the realms of nothingness, beyond even the underworld. I have come back from beyond the abyss that outstretches the deepest nether realms. Bow now my son. Bow before your father who is conquered in eternity. Bow now, you traitor, for either way this chaos beast's form is once more your fate for your treachery against me. Instruction. The chaos beast's image in the Jacob's Ladders, arcing sparks quavers like the reflection of the moon on a rippling pond. Suddenly, the reptilian arisen corpse of the mummified Nyarlahotep is possessed by the soul of Imhotep, and the chaos beast's infernal form possessed once more by Nyarlahotep. Imhotep, portrayed by the actor previously portraying Nyarlahotep. Let it all come down. My revelation shall outlast it all, for I have been to the world beyond Beriah, and I have surveyed the new Jerusalem. Its twelve gates are the twelve houses of the Amduat. 
Its seven-sided church I have beheld inside and out, and it is like the seven bay of Ra between the Ka and the Ak. Instruction. The Chaos Beast looms through the electricity screen. It is a puppet armature of tentacles centered around a corpuscle eye, red with rage and streaming tears. Its pupil is a mouth, and its iris a row of hooked fangs. Nyarlahotep, booming. Tahotep, you may escape, but Imhotep, you shall not. I shall pursue you until the final Sabbath, and see your clay corpse buried beyond the wasteland's outskirts, on the edge of nothingness. Your home for eternity shall be to guard the west bank of the river Styx. Your destiny will be to wander eternally alone, licking sand to search for salty silt. You will yet suffer my fate for me. I will never die. I will get you. Instruction. Imhotep urges the candidate away, toward the shoreline and the door of the vault, away from the twin pillars and the chaos beast near Lahotep. Imhotep, turning to near Lahotep. Near Lahotep, O oh terrifying, feverish insanity, you cannot harm me because I am one loyal to God who sent me. I have cast you already into the emptiness of the abyss once by my word. I shall not say it again except by action. Come at me, and your will will wilt, O oh chaos beast. You shall forever lose what little light of hope you have left. Forsake now. Nyarlahotep. You are unwise to be unjust to me, your servant, O Vizier. For I have sat upon the seat to which you would now ascend. The corpses are all of me, all mine alone to command. I was bound only to this portal until you returned my true form to me. Now I cross the threshold once and forever to dwell in the land of the living and leave behind the world of the dead with you in it. Imhotep. Nyarlahotep, you, whose one eye hungers for justice, must repent now your lust for the powers of this world. I warn you, they are only an illusion, and I can turn them against you. Nyarlahotep. It is too late for you now. I summon Marduk, king of demons. I summon Cthulhu, of chaos and formlessness. I summon Satan and Moloch, the twin-headed devil. I summon the host of all Hades to spread your plague upon this realm, the material universe. Fly free, all you damned gargoyles. I unchain thee in Imhotep's name. Instruction. As the puppeteered armature of tentacles undulates, the whole of the chaos beast's pupil mouth dilates to engorge the sclera. Through his eye, Nyarlahotep vomits himself inside out. Black smoke bellows out of the emptied out Nyarlahotep, whose tentacles now take root around the twin main hairs, as he stretches himself open across the gateway to the underworld. His remaining flesh gapes agog and tears through to reveal a portal to the inferno of hell. Imhotep, to candidate. Tahotep, my son, go to call all the undead to return as warriors behind you. I, in Nyarlahotep's clay body, must enter the gateway of Nyarlahotep and battle him upon the threshold before he can widen the rift in the veil turning again to Nyarlahotep. You cannot cast curses before a man sent to you by God. 
if you will not approach me, and be laid waste by my righteousness here, then I shall take my word to you now. Instruction As Imhotep approaches near Lahotep, the initiator, or guide, who prepared the candidate and who is snuck up behind them, now takes the candidate arm in arm and escorts them towards and out the vault door and into the antechamber, discussing with the candidate as they walk the meaning of this degree's ritual. Guide So you see how we transcend the mortal world while still alive. We must delve deep into our minds inside our quantum thoughts that guide our nerves to control our DNA. We must conquer the urge to destroy and do evil there, deep within each of us. Know that only you can do this for yourself, but that you are not alone in doing it. Truly, there are a legion of us who are seeking to transcend the mortal world while still alive. We all work together in this great karma yoga. The battle between order and chaos is within each of us. We must therefore live life rightly as a warrior for increased perception increased awareness and expansion of consciousness both our own others and that of the entire cosmos the true overseer's order is open to any who have become inverted from the mundane and it is thus comprised only of those who have graduated from labor by working to perfect themselves because we have transcended cares for the material world, we are able to look down upon it from above. But only if we work to perfect ourselves do we preserve our place on the planes above. We can each do good alone. When we all work together, we can do even better. Therefore, seek out and surround those who do good alone, and in invisible silence encourage their good deeds when they are ready to they will learn how to assist others and to command their reality by communing with their inner will and confronting the conflict between good and evil in the deepest realms of the seekers mind they find this inverting dualism for it is the binary language of our quantum thoughts themselves. We input binary logic and output creative uncertainty, and that is how our mind makes itself manifest around us in our material world. Each of us is like the bright singularity at the umbilical navel between a parent black hole and a baby universe. The fabric of the space-time continuum itself softens, melts, and molds itself to the touch of the mind. But only those of us who knowingly and rightly do good deeds and thus perfect their karma know how to sustain and to control our mental grasp on our own realities. We understand the multiverse surrounds the outside of the womb of our perception. We understand how to manifest rightly because we have chosen to conquer the dualism of good and evil by asserting our innermost will over the most fundamental quantum uncertainty. If you do not understand, you will have plenty of time for asking questions. For now you are considered a true self-overseer. Welcome to the Overseer's Order. The first title is History. The first thing we learn from prolonging duration of meditation on the Tree of Life is the magic memory. 
The magic memory is omniscient of past events and can, by applying periodic cycles, rightly predict the future. However, because chaos increases in Asaya, we are only able to see our universe expanding from within. However, if we elevate our point of view to faster than the speed of light, then we can see that it is only because our universe is being swallowed up into a hypersphere surrounding us. Just as yet Syrah is passing through Asaya, our material reality is being consumed into the energy of the emanations. Asaya is dissolving into Baraya by yet Syrah passing through it. Now, another name for the world of Baraya, or Eden, surrounding Asaya, our material universe, is sum over histories of all particles in the universe. The sum over histories is the halo of wormholes and baby universes surrounding our universe as it is being eaten apart from within by black holes. This is the multiverse of tachyons in n dimensions called hyperspace and called the world of Bariah or Eden. This is, it should be recalled, only the lowest of the kingdoms of heaven. The seven lower sephirot are the seven color spectrum of light that comprises the barrier between our universal singularity, our center of which is the Milky Way's galactic core, and the multiversal sum over histories of tachyonic wormholes that comprises hyperspace of n dimensions surrounding our local three dimensions in a phi over pi torus identical to the aura of our soul and the chakras of the kundalini spiral inside it. All of this is recorded in the knowledge accessible by the magic memory because all of these things are occurring relative to one another in more or less predictably periodic cycles. Knowledge of the records accessed by the magic memory is collectively called the history of our order. The use of the magical memory attained after one has graduated from labor by studying Yetzira, the tree of life, and has begun to perceive the multiversal kingdom of paradise, Eden or Bariah, is the subject of teaching in this degree. The second title is Shibboleth, Jakin. Hebrew was esoteric hieroglyphics used among the overseer's order to keep their plans private from the couriers. Likewise, the blueprints the overseers used were draftings of shapes impossible to craft in three dimensions. Penrose triangles, impossible cubes, hypercrosses, toroids, and tesseracts. The Kabbalistic tree of life itself is a tesseract, or hypercube, viewed at antipode, or above one of the shape's figurative edges. The tesseract, or tree of life, was considered a hyperspace square, and the torus a hyperspace circle. Thus, the relationship between the torus and tesseract to the overseers was interpreted as a square-shaped circle, or, more accurately, the square of equal area to a circle, by the quarriers. That is how the pyramids were built, 
using geometry, a common language spanning across levels that could be separated by alphabets. The couriers who graduated from labor and became overseers learned to understand the strange hypershapes and metaphors used by the overseers and to read Hebrew, a now lost language, modern Hebrew being derived from Aramaic, derived from hieratic, derived from hieroglyphics. All that remains known for certain about the ancient Hebrew alphabet was that it was comprised of 22 letters, equivalent to the 12 constellations of the zodiac, the seven planets, or chakras, and the three supernal elements. With only these 22 phonetic symbols, the overseers were able to represent any number of cosmological relationships. By simply applying them to hypershapes and studying the various complex relationships, the overseers sought to restore understanding of the Atlantean calendar as part of true masonry's arts. In truth, the Atlantean calendar is only a map of the karma in the aura of ourselves, our galaxy, and our universe. The third title is Yetzira. Yetzira is the union of the exterior aura, both of the individual and that of our universe, and its interior spiral, the seven kundalini chakras of the individual, and the seven color spectrum of light. Therefore, the tree of life of Yetzirah, the Sephirot emanations by which God created, is both the seven lesser Sephirot and the triad of supernal Sephirot. The seven lower Sephirot represent the seven colors and seven chakras, and the three greater Sephirot, the spiritual or higher elements the combinations of mental states occurring between interior mind and exterior matter via the surface tension of the energy that conjoins them. The seven chakras, seven colors, and seven sephirot all form a spiral measuring the interior of the torus, the shape of the soul, the exterior of which is the aura or hypersphere that is the environment surrounding the individual and the multiverse of Bariya. Thus, Yetzira, the tree of life, is an exterior square model of the interior circular shape of both the soul and the multiverse. Just as the interior soul is a torus, so the exterior tree of life is a tesseract. Just as Bariya is the exterior hypersphere surrounding Asaya, the interior sphere, so is Yetzira a measurement of the difference between them, i.e., a squared circle, or a tesseract with the same area as the difference between the inner and outer hypersphere of the universe surrounded by the multiverse. Thus, we can use the tesseract, tree of life, to measure Yetzirah as the change between the interior and outer spheres as Yetzirah passes through Asaya and consumes Asaya into Bariya, the multiverse, a process known as involution. As the multiverse eats the universe over time, the exterior sphere shrinking the interior sphere. 
The tesseract measures the change between them. Thus, we refer to the tesseract of Tao sub Tao, ultimate extension of the cube of time or perfect ashlar, and to Thoth, the god of time, as Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest. So we call the tesseract tree of life an external model of time and say that it measures the change between our souls and the multiverse. The fourth title is Creation. This refers to the level of Yetzira in its proper place, supernal to Bariah, which itself was once paradise upon earth, the multiverse one with the material universe, Bariah upon the face of Asaya. However, when the interior complexification of the initial singularity of our universe appeared from within to begin expanding, at that point of critical mass, when baby universes began bubbling off of our universe through black holes, then Bariah and Yetzira switched places, and as the tesseract of Yetzira and the multiversal exterior hypersphere passed through one another, this was when the universe of material reality fell and became separate from the multiverse of paradise above. This moment, beginning in some places at the first Planck time after the Big Bang, and following the formation of the four universally elementary forces, represented the beginning of entropy and the four forces' destruction through inversion. As matter energy is pulled through a black hole, it is inverted into antimatter particles and micro wavelength tachyons. Thus, each baby universe is only as massive as the amount of energy it consumes and only as dense as the amount of mass. These black holes are each points on an enormous shifting web of galactic filaments each connected by microwave tachyon superstrings in hyperspace, comprising the broken and fragmented remains of the originally pre-critical mass, perfect periodicity of all the cycling patterns of matter and energy, and the equilibrium of the four elemental forces. We model this originally perfect periodicity as a tesseract. In truth, it was only Bariah, before yet Syrah, created Asaya from it. Paradise was a perfect diamond in the rough, but shattered when cut. Thus, we call the creation both the universe before critical mass and the multiverse after. The creation is the ongoing involution of the multiverse of Bariah through the universe of Asaya, measured by the Tree of Life Tesseract of Yetzira. This occurs as matter is exchanged out of the universe into the multiverse, through black holes, and energy is exchanged into the universe and out of the multiverse through the wormholes or time tunnels connecting them along the galactic filaments. All this is simultaneously the creation and destruction of both. The fifth title is Air. 
The force of air is associated with the Tree of Life Tesseract of Yetzirah. Just as this tesseract changes form over time, so does the wind rustle through the tree. We see the wind by observing the movement of the leaves on the tree. These leaves move and change digitally, some moving while others do not, just like the karmic cliffoth of Chi in our auras. We can therefore only see the true and invisible form of the air, true essence of Yetzira, surface of Bariah beyond, and Asaya below. By observing the nature and movement of changes to karma in our aura, and this we call meditating on the tree of life because the exterior environment of karma in our aura is a reflection of our interior alignment and flow of kundalini energy through our chakras. There is an ancient Zen cone stating that neither the wind nor the flag is what is actually moving, but only the mind. This refers to the alignment of the lesser will, the individual's mind, with the greater will, the universal mind. When the mind of our universe moves through our own mind, like the wind in the tree or the billowing flag, then we can understand how our emotions and subconscious thoughts occur as more or less regular cycles because they are merely points moving along the edges of hyperspatial shapes such as the tree of life tesseract passing through our minds as our souls involute over time the longer we maintain this state of clear-mindedness meditating on the tree of life tesseract of Yetzirah the more we will realize these metaphors moving through us all are archetypal to our collective consciousness and that we are all sharing in this splendorous emanating of creation together. The sixth title is Twelve. This refers to the twelve constellations of the zodiac. In Greek, which is more like ancient Hebrew than even modern Hebrew, the twelve consonants stand for the zodiac and the seven vowels for the seven planets. From very early on, at least since the Exodus, if not following then from a long, fragmented prior tradition, it is evident that the seven days of the week were implemented along with the twelve-hour days and twelve-hour nights. Thus, a complex correspondence exists between the seven days and twelve hours of day and night. However, to understand the overseer's point of view on the calendar, you must think like an Atlantean mason. The twelve surround the seven. The seven connect between the twelve in various alignments and arrays. The twelve are compared to the supernal three sephiroth and the planets to the lower seven sephiroth. This is not altogether accurate, however, because Though the seven chakras compare with the seven planets and the seven lower sephirot, the twelve constellations do not compare with the three spiritual or alchemical elements. The origins of the twelve signs are lost to history, but some philosophical researchers speculate they grew out of the ten 
when one of them was divided into two and an additional one interpolated between the two halves. However, this would not account for the splendid math of the twelve constellations, rendering 36 deacons of 10 degrees each, completing the 360 degree circle, the double to form the 72 angels of the Exodus verse, describing the parting of the Red Sea, as well as of Solomon's Goetia. Originally, the 72 were 50 plus 22. This is one side of the arc. The other side was that 12 times 6 equals 72. Thus, by 12 of 22, 72. And thus, by 5, 360 from 72. Just as by 5, 50 from 10. All of this together comprises the Atlantean Tarot, understood rightly as the tool to reading the Atlantean calendar. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of 2B Degree Overseer's Order.